Hi, I'm Nora Neal, and I'm a professor of writing at Grand Rapids Community College, and today I have the great pleasure of speaking with Emily Bazelon, who wrote the book Sticks and Stones, uh, Defeating the Culture of Bullying and Rediscovering the Power of Character and Empathy. Hi, Emily. Hi, Nora. Um, so we're talking uh, a lot about your book today and the, the whole idea of bullying. And you've written about lots of things in um, Slate and otherwise. And I'm wondering why bullying, why that is um, the place you decided to go. And um, as any writer knows, if you're going to embark on a project as long as a book, you have to have some sustained interest. So why this topic? Well, I noticed a few years ago that there are lots of news stories bubbling up about bullying. And I was curious about them as a journalist and also as a parent, because my kids are now 10 and 13. And in particular, I wanted to think about how the internet is changing what it's like to grow up, because we, as adults, just didn't have social media the way kids do now. And that seemed to me like a pretty important change agent. And I just wanted to get my hands around it as a mother, as well as a reporter. And then I think what the topic turned into and the reason it did sustain my interest is I basically think that the attention to bullying right now that adults are showing is kind of an excuse. It's like a reason for us to think about school culture and how to make kids' lives better, how to improve their emotional well-being and their social welfare. And I think bullying is useful in the sense that it cuts across class and demographics. It's an issue in cities and suburbs and rural areas. So everybody has a stake in it. And that seemed to me to make it a kind of potentially promise, promising way to talk about um, kids' lives. So really, you think it's more of a means to an end. And it's not so much about bullying itself, because um, what you've said is that bullying actually only um, touches uh, 10 to 15 percent of um, 10 to 25 percent. 10 to 25. But yeah, you're right. It's not something that all kids do or experience. If you define bullying in a limited way, which I'm in favor of doing, then it's um, a more kind of minority behavior. But I also think you're right that it's a means to also talking about kids' social lives more broadly and what kids often call drama, which is like a conflict that goes back and forth in which the power dynamic is shifting. Mm -hmm. Bullying is verbal or physical abuse that continues over time where there's a power imbalance. So one person really has the power. Um, another way I think about it is like a real campaign to make a child miserable. Mm -hmm. Luckily, we don't see that happen so often. But all these underlying issues of aggression and um, how kids are being aggressive online, those are things that lots of people are grappling with. Mm -hmm. So as you profiled, you profiled um, three uh, adolescents, and then you also talk about schools later in your in your book, some specific schools. Um, but I wonder what it was like to intimately learn about the experience of bullying or the experience of drama from um, these three different uh, kids. It was fascinating. I love talking to teenagers. You know, if you get the right teenagers <laughs> who want to talk, they will just, in a very honest way, tell you exactly what's going on. And I was really interested in reporting on this issue from a variety of viewpoints, because I think usually what we see in the media is the victim's point of view or the victim's parent and not that much else. So I wanted to also talk to the kids who are drawn to bullying and figure out why and what was going on from their point of view. So that to me was like one of the challenges of the book was finding stories where I could have a variety of different points of view and really then following through on the reporting. And I learned a lot from, from listening. So what was your process when you were writing the book? How did you uh, begin it? And how did you find these particular um, kids, Jacob, Monique, and uh, Flannery? That's a great question. I found Flannery through local news stories. She was a girl, who, she lives in Connecticut where I live, and her parents had gotten very angry. Her mother had, and grandmother had gotten very angry with her school and the school board for not doing enough to help her in her mother's view and had pulled Monique out of school. So that was a pretty dramatic event. And Monique was then out of school for a year and there was this kind of stalemate going on between her mom and the school board. 
So I, that was how I found that family. And then I spent a lot of time in the school, the middle school she went to, talking to the girls who had caused the trouble to kind of figure out what was motivating them. Um, Jacob lives in upstate New York. And I wanted to uh, make sure that one of the main characters of the book was a kid who was LGBT or gender non-traditional in some way, because that's a really vulnerable category of kids. And I wanted to make sure to really think through the issues they're experiencing. And then I also wanted to find a kid who had successfully sued his school district. I was just interested in that dynamic. So I found him through his lawyers. And then the story about Flannery um, uh, uh, came from a community in Massachusetts. And essentially, the it started with the suicide of Phoebe Prince, who's the um, the another of the characters in the book and that story was a huge story in the news and people I knew who lived nearby told me about it it wasn't that far from my house that community so I started driving up and doing a lot of reporting there and my reporting method with all of these stories especially Flannery's and Phoebe's story but all of them was really to spend as much time as I could. I like to pick uh, reporting opportunities near where I live because I like to go back over and over again. I think that is really the way to understand how people are living their lives. Um, so yeah. You seem to remain relatively objective in your telling of the stories. Was that difficult to do or to stay um, sort of distanced from the situation? Like you weren't interjecting and trying to give advice. I know in one instance you did help one of the kids, but. Yeah, I don't think, I don't actually treasure objectivity that much. I try really hard to be fair, mm. and I want to make sure that I'm um, being true to the story. And in this case, I, when you're writing intimately about people's lives, I think that also means presenting a portrait of them that they would recognize because it's really about them. But at the same time, I'm not a stenographer. I don't just like write down mm -hmm. everything people say, and I'm also aware that I'm shaping the story and really turning it into my version of their story. Um, but I did feel um, worried about all of these kids, and I had a lot of opinions. They're not, they weren't ideological opinions so much as opinions driven by my reporting about who was doing what and whether I thought these schools should be stepping up more and, you know, what was motivating the kids and the parents. So I spent a lot of time thinking about that. But as a writer, I want people to come to my book and be able to think about the choices people made without feeling hit on the head about what the right answers were. Mm -hmm. I was pr thinking about parents and teachers reading the book and also teenagers. And I think when you are presenting with a story where you can think through the choices for yourself, it's just a more powerful learning tool. Mm -hmm. But I guess it's important to say I did take this sort of for a journalist, this untraditional step, I helped Monique. Um, she really needed to start going back to school. And I watched for this whole year thinking that this problem would be solved. But there was only one middle school in her school district. And the district was determined she was going to go back to that school. And her mother was determined that she was not going to go back to that school. And I um, finally did step in and call the state um, Department of Education and try to help her figure out how she could find another school. So why do you think these stories are important to tell or maybe stories more broadly even? Well, I think that people learn um, how to value other people's feelings through stories. We can't, we can only have our own experiences, but when you read other people's stories, you can get incredibly drawn into what it's like to have someone else's life. And that's such an important act of imagination. It's what the kind of core element of empathy is all about, understanding people's feelings and also valuing them. So when you're talking about kids who are experiencing problems, I think it's crucial to have a broad audience for, um, for understanding what they're going through as a way of helping other kids, figuring out what interventions might work, how to prevent this problem, why to take it seriously. And I think the one of the most powerful vehicles we have for that as human beings are individual narratives. We just really respond to one story about one child. So that was really what I was trying to get across. So in addition to stories, reading stories, telling stories, exchanging stories, um, what are some other ways that we can develop empathy? I think it's a um, invaluable skill, but I think it's also something that's really hard to develop. And I think even as adults, we have trouble with that. 
Right. Well, because o- empathy means opening yourself up to emotion and letting other people's problems really get inside you, which can be exhausting and difficult to do. But it's so important to living. And, you know, if you if you don't open yourself to that, then you're missing so much of the human experience. I think one important factor in empathy, though, to point out is that if you're having a lot of trouble yourself, it can be it can open you to empathy in the sense that you understand, but it can also mean that it's overwhelming to think about other people's problems. So part of this is recognizing kind of where you sit on your own psychological spectrum and what's fair to expect of yourself. Mm-hmm. So uh, your uh, research and the stories that you learned about and your um, investigation of bullying, how does this Uh, translate in the adult world? Why is it important for adults to think about or even uh, college students to think about? What are the, what's the relationship between uh, maybe middle school bullying and what happens in the adult world? You know, I was just working on a survey about bullying or aggression in the workplace among women. And some of the comments that came back were, this is just like eighth grade. You know, (laughs) the office troubles I'm having remind me of how I felt when there was this mean girl who was not sitting next to me at the lunch table. So there are ways in which these childhood patterns really do um, recur and repeat in adulthood. You know, hopefully adults have more coping mechanisms or they're just able to get away and just not let things get to them as much. But sometimes it is upsetting and we really do feel that old, kind of powerless, vulnerable feeling. Um, So I think that adults can relate to the stories for that reason. And also, this topic is incredibly easy to talk to people about because everybody, almost everybody, has some vivid memory of having been a victim of bullying, having done something they regret, perhaps, or having seen something happen that upset them. So I think for that reason, it's pretty easy for adults to tap into that childhood experience. So what do we do as adults walking around in this world with a bunch of bully baggage, carrying that around? How do we um, deal with that if it's still this um, leftover feeling? I mean, you talk about your own story with uh, bullying, witnessing it, and feeling excluded by your friends in eighth grade. So uh, what do we do that now that we're adults and we have these recollections of bullying? Well, if they're not overwhelming and they're not things that have really um, unraveled us emotionally and psychologically, then I think we use them to remember what kids are going through in order to try to help them. And also they become woven into the fabric of how we think about being kind to other people and why that's so important. Um, You know, experiencing unkindness can really show you how crucial it is for to treat other people differently. It's like a basic human truth, but it's worth learning over and over again. Which kind of ties into this idea of um, resiliency and different levels of resiliency. And one of the things that you really... um, stress, I think, in your book is the complexity of this topic of bullying. And I kept, as I was reading the, the book, when I started it, I thought, um, what awful thing is going to happen in like the first 10 pages? Because that's what our culture um, keeps, keeps uh, telling us about bullying. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about this complexity and um, psychological differences and how that relates to this topic. Well, one aspect of the complexity is that um, kids react to different things differently. Some kids are going to really make it through a negative experience. Even if other kids are coming after them, they're going to have enough support at home or enough belief in themselves that they're going to um, override all of that bad stuff and probably come out stronger for it. The problem is we just don't know that every kid, We, in fact, we know that every kid will not be able to overcome it and that there are these ways in which being bullied can be scary for kids. I was talking recently with a principal who said, you know, we really don't see it very much, pure bullying of um, of one child really being made powerless. But when you do, it's very upsetting because you can see the kid kind of go dark and withdraw into themselves. Um, so, you know, I think that's the thing we have to look out for. Resilience is an incredibly important part of this equation because the more we can help build the capacity for resilience, then the better off people are and the more we can afford to let tough experiences play out. But, you know, some people have more um, inner resources or more outer resources to draw on than other people. So it's like a constant 
struggle to kind of think about how a particular kid and a particular case is oriented and playing out versus these generalizations that you'd kind of like to draw about the whole dynamic. Mm -hmm. How do you think, or do you think that um, being a part of the LGBT uh, community raises the stakes or if there's um, other layers of complexity that come in when the child being um, bullied or uh, people are being mean to the child um, is either uh, gay or perceived to be gender different. Right. So there's no question that LGBT kids and kids who are perceived as being gay are at a greater risk of harassment. That's just like a basic issue they're facing. The way I think about it is that they're on the frontier. Um, you know, the country's support for gay rights is increasing at a rapid pace. It's kind of amazing how fast it's moving, but that doesn't mean it's everywhere. And so kids, particularly sometimes in more isolated rural communities, they'll turn on t the television and get a message of acceptance from gay figures in the pop culture or a show like Glee, and then they'll kind of feel empowered to come out or to, as Jacob in my book was like wearing lipstick and makeup, but that just doesn't fly where they live. And so they're being themselves, and that's like an amazing, powerful thing, but it has a real risk, and I think that's still what we're seeing. I actually am really hopeful that this is something that's truly changing. Of all the issues I write about, I feel like gay rights is the one where I see the most progress. But that doesn't mean that, you know, we're there yet and that there isn't a lot of hardship along the way. You seem like somewhat of an advocate for um, gay rights. I think that that uh, came across a little bit in your book, but also in the other things you've written. So I wonder if you can talk about why you think that that's in, important to um, be an ally. Oh, well, I mean, I just think it's a matter of basic equality and that, you know, when you look, so now I'm going to go into my Supreme Court reporter mode, but in 1967, the court ruled in Loving versus Virginia that people of different races could marry each other and that states couldn't ban that practice. We take that for granted now as a basic civil right. And I think in the same way that we're having this debate over gay marriage, something that seems strange until it becomes more common and until it becomes accepted, then the whole perception just flips and it becomes something that, like, of course, people should be able to marry whoever they want. Um, and we should live in a world where the laws apply equally. Unless, and, and I think underlying all this for me is that when the government is going to restrict a particular right, they have to have a good reason to do that. And for a long time, there was this notion that gay couples were not going to be fit parents in the same way and that kids raised in their households would be worse off. But that's just not true. I mean, we have a lot of research now showing that those kids do totally fine. And I think a lot of anecdotal evidence from the states in which gay marriage has been around for a while that... This is something that strengthens marriage as an institution as well as enriching the lives of the people who are directly affected by it. So to me, this one is like a kind of no-brainer. This one is not complicated to me. <laughs> How do you see your role as a journalist um, influencing this change or reflecting the change or um, being a part of it? Somehow? I think I reflect it probably more than I influence it, but I feel no responsibility to be neutral about it. I think there are certain struggles that you can identify as a journalist. And part of this is I'm a magazine writer, I'm an opinion writer, um, but I think that it's... Um, this is an issue I feel very, uh, I feel good about cheering for one side of this issue. I want to still cover it in a fair way and make sure I'm being um, honest with my readers, but um, I think it's also the right thing to do to sort of make my own sense of it clear. Mm -hmm. So um, what are you writing about right now that is really exciting for you? You've uh, finished this book. It, um, it's wonderful, and um, now you're continuing to work on other projects. So what are you excited about writing about right now? Well, I'm working on a magazine story right now that's sort of related to my book. It's about the hacker collective Anonymous and the work they've been doing online, which they think of as anti-bullying work. And that has meant, in a lot of cases, getting involved where there's a girl who says she's been raped and then is the target of a lot of victim blaming. 
And maybe the police don't step in on her behalf in the way that seems like they should. And so anonymous, which really means like individual people who call themselves anonymous, have been showing up in these cases and really trying to um, push for justice for the for the girls. And there's some this has happened recently in Maryville, Missouri. There's a big case going on right now where this is true. So like a lot of things, I'm drawn because I don't think there's like a clear answer. On the one hand, you can see these internet activists playing a really powerful role in these cases. On the other hand, this is vigilante justice. And I think whenever you see vigilantes at work, you have to be worried about what the ill effects are going to be. And it has been true in some of these cases that they've um, falsely accused people, that accusations that have to do with a couple of boys turn then become this kind of community wide smearing and lots of innocent people get um, accused of doing things they didn't do. So that's sort of the interplay in that story. So um, as a writer, what do you see as your uh, great strengths? Oh, ah. <laughs> Let's see. Do I have any? <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, maybe maybe this is a, a, a easier question. What do you see as strengths in writing? So I, I teach writing, and um, I think everybody has different things they like. I really like stories. Mm -hmm. I find stories very compelling. I think telling a good story is an uh, invaluable skill to learn and to teach. So. Uh, maybe that's an easier question than uh, <laughs> speaking for yourself. So what do you see as strengths in good writing? Well, I completely agree about storytelling. I also think making an argument is important, too. Having a point you're conveying with the story. Why this story? What is the um, narrative arc here? What do you want your readers to come away with? And so sometimes that means the kind of analysis and homework for storytelling that's like less fun. It's more about, you know, mastering an area of research or law or medicine, whatever it is, so that you know what the point of your story is. So I think those are kind of two two legs of the stool. And then I think the third leg is just really great writing, like just making something sentence by sentence a piece of entertainment that people want to keep going, that that's the other really crucial hat we wear as writers is simply to keep people on the page. So how do you do that and how do you continue to improve as a writer or to make sure that you're accomplishing that goal? Well, I hope I'm accomplishing that goal. <laughs> I'm always concerned about it. And I think what I work on um, all the time is this idea that um, you're just trying to build from one to the next, that you're making it as easy as possible for someone to follow you. And sometimes the more complicated an idea is, the more care you have to take with presenting it so that people will make it through the dense paragraph um, and understand the ideas in it. I think it's an act of translation and that um, you know, I work with, as an editor, I often work with academics, particularly law professors who are trying to write. And sometimes they forget about all the things that most people don't know. And so they use language that other most people won't be able to follow, or they just don't explain in the most intuitive way. Um, and I think reporters can do that too, because you get so immersed in the story, you get lost in the weeds, you forget what drew you to it in the first place, and what other people have to understand in order to see what you see. Mm -hmm. That's like the constant challenge. Thank you. You're welcome. That's for good advice. Um, so what makes your uh, job as a journalist difficult? What makes um, telling these stories or weaving these stories um, together well? What, what challenges do you encounter? Well, you know, sometimes I think of putting together a big piece as like a wedding where everything has to come out. All the pieces have to be in play. I mean, if the caterer cancels on you at the last minute, it's just going to fall apart. That's, I suppose, really about the reporting, the idea that um, you need various voices. You need the elements to put the story together. And so when I'm reporting, I'm always worrying that someone will refuse to talk to me who I need to talk to, or someone will stop talking to me. That's like a terrifying thing for reporters because you've done a lot of work and then if someone pulls the plug on you then you're kind of left with like some half finished business. Um, so I think that it's the reporting that gives me, I mean it's the most pleasurable because it's exciting, it's a discovery, but it's also I suppose the thing you have the least control over and that can go wrong too. So um, 
would you say if you were going to choose any career that like this is what makes you happy and um, being a journalist and an editor and writing is your uh, dream job? Yeah, it really is. I When I went to law school, I spent a lot of time thinking about whether I should just go and be a lawyer and do things instead of observing other people doing things. Um, and I think it's great when people find work and a cause they're passionate about that they are directly participating in. But for me, this is incredibly fun. I mean, I still am amazed that I can ask people all kinds of questions and they'll answer. It just seems like such a privilege that people will trust me with their stories and take the time to explain. So as long as I can keep doing that, um, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. How did you discover that this was the thing that um, really suited you and fit you? I started working as a, or not working, but I started be, being a journalist in college and just found it to be kind of a roller coaster of um, figuring things out. It, every story, a good story is like you're being a detective. You're putting all these pieces of a puzzle together. And sometimes what you think in the beginning is the most interesting thing or just that you think you know the story and there's always something that surprises you along the way and makes you realize you were wrong. Sometimes in a relatively minor way, but sometimes your whole perception will be upended by what you find. And to me, that's exciting. And I also think that if you're truly being driven by your reporting, then as, as your opinions take shape, it's a way of being very open-minded in the world, that you're looking at what you find instead of coming and putting your preconceptions on top of that, if that makes sense. So what is something um, that most of our audience members wouldn't know about you that you don't usually talk about when you're um, doing interviews? Oh, that's a good question. What am I going to tell you about that? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Well, maybe I'll tell you this. So I um, have, am, I like to bake. That's not such a secret, but I kind of like to bake at night after my kids have gone to sleep. Really, I should be baking with them or certainly for <laughs> them, but I actually have this sort of um, secret habit of making things like after they go to bed and then they'll wake up and they'll say, Mom, I thought you made brownies. Where are they? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having this conversation with me today, Emily. It was really pleasant. Thank you for your great questions, Nora.